It is unclear when the bay's early human inhabitants arrived. Were they the survivors of the vast era of change when the bay was formed? Or were they an entirely new people? One thinks of California Indians and Bay Area Indians as not having left that much effect on the landscape. But there were, up until recently, hundreds of, of fairly imposing significant features. These shell mounds are complexes of, of mounds made largely out of shells. If you're living on the bay and you're throwing the refuse downwind from your village, after 100, 200, many, many years, a mound is growing. And your village is here now, and the mound is here. The rains come, your village gets wiped out. And you say, you know what? Let's go put some dirt on top of the mound and put our houses up there, and we'll start throwing the shells over there. This goes on for four or 5,000 years in the San Francisco Bay region. And the shell mounds themselves are really a testimony to the persistence and the uh, kind of extent of native culture in the area. Previously, people gathered grasses as a staple. Now, they also gathered the abundant acorns the oak woodlands provided. That and the rich supply of shellfish the vast bay produced. We love to imagine that this was wild land. And there were a few Indians that every so often an acorn would fall off a tree and they'd snag it. Uh, but um, the fact of the matter is that this was a deeply cultivated land, that it was burned regularly, that burning affected the grasslands, it affected the brushlands, it fostered the right kinds of grasses, the right kinds of trees. I mean, it cre they created an environment that was good for themselves. Around the estuary, as many as 20,000 people lived speaking an astounding variety of languages, and loosely defined today into two groups, the Coast Miwok in the North Bay and the Ohlone in the East and South. My name is Chuck Stripland. I am a member of the Mutsum Band of Ohlone Indians. By 1900, the 300,000 native people who once occupied California were reduced to perhaps 25,000. Much of their 5,000-year-old culture vanished. In 1935, the last speaker of an Ohlone language died. Today, survivors try to reclaim a lost culture. Within our community, the knowledge of building these boats actually has been reconstructed from um, uh, specimens that we've looked at in, in museums. Uh, there are members of, of other local tribes, some of the Pomo, some of the Coast Miwok, um, that have retained that knowledge within the community and we are seeking guidance from them. From my perspective, both trained as a scientist and also a, as a, a practitioner of these traditional arts now, it allows us to regain the relationship with those resources. Kind of a long-term monitoring process. We're now interacting with the Thule, and hopefully we'll do so years and years and years in the future. And what that allows us to do in a very precise way is actually monitor the health of the Thule over time. It allows us to notice and be aware if there's any changes going on in, in the ecology of the system. The world the Ohlone and Miwok inhabited was an astounding place, one of the richest environments in all of North America. It was an abundant place to live. It was a good place to live. You had the resources of the land, but most particularly you had the resources of the water. You had salmon runs, you had other fish, and always you had shellfish and invertebrates, crabs and whatnot. It was thick with wildlife. There was uh, grizzly bears, there were condors, there were bald eagles, there were mountain lions. You had here an amazing wildlife presence. If you were a person during those times, you would have been a person living in a world that was dominated by animal presence all around you. 